Watch how it works. You just laugh along with me. Here we go. My, <laughs> my wife joined a cult. <laughs> She moved out in the middle of the night <laughs> and took the kids. <laughs> I came back from a trip, <laughs> expected her to pick me up at the airport. <laughs> she said, read your email. <laughs> Craig. Thank you for being here, my man. And my last name is Shoemaker, by the way. That's pretty That's easy. A lot of, no, it's not. A lot of people do the Schumacher, bro. Really? They, they put the umlaut, like I'm off the boat from Bavaria. Or they, they shoe, you make shoes, you don't mock shoes, okay? That's Unless just, they're Crocs. Those you can mock. Yeah, I think, I think the mock would be like my, my second option. Um, <laughs> well, it's usually people's first. It drives me It's spelled like Shoemaker, too. I know. It seems pretty straightforward for me. Yeah, it seems that way, but a lot of people complicate it. I think they want to make me into something that I'm not, you know, like a isn't that LA? A little European. Oh, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> we are in LA. We so are in LA. So let's pretend we're not. I'm going to pretend we're in New York for the rest of this or Philly for like where you're from. I lived um, in New York too. What part are you from in New York? I was more in Staten Island. Oh, okay. Yeah. I lived in Long, Long Beach. I lived in Manhattan, all over Manhattan. I'm getting the so. itch to go back. Yeah. You know what's great about it is, I mean, what's, what was not great about it when I was there is I didn't have money. Now that I have money, it's a much better place. Yeah, <laughs> you know, I'm sure. When I was interviewing for apartments and stuff and I'm smelling urine, this guy's asking me if I put my socks on the floor. I'm going, did you, you do pee in the corner? I mean, it's, it's a whole other deal when you're trying to find roommates and you have no money. But now New York is wonderful. It's the best. I mean, I've I even it. when it's gone through whatever you want to call it, I still it's just always New York to me. My family's in Jersey, so it's I'm I'm trying to I'm, once this gets to even it's this podcast is gratefully taking a big jump, but once it gets to uh, I could fully sustain myself in this. Yeah. So anyone listening, if you want to help me fully sustain myself, uh, go do it now. <laughs> then I can I, would, I love to go back and forth because that's that's the the game. But my mom's kind of giving me a little bit more of a shove these days to get yeah. my ass back there. Um, but it's not about my family. It's not about my life. Um, Craig, thank you for being here. And I definitely want to tap into your plethora of experience, as you kind of alluded to. One of the reasons I'm here, by the way, though, is how your life did inspire this podcast, which is something I resonate with. 9-11? Uh, but all of it, the grieving. And that's the kind of thing that I like to talk about. I'm a comedian, obviously. I could be funny. and I've, But I tell my team, I work with a team, and I say, go find me podcasts that I can talk about mental health physical health, emotional health, spiritual health. And that's what you do. So that's why I'm here. I love that. I mean, this is, yeah, it is a podcast about death, but it's ultimately is a very uh, specific circle in, in and around mental health. Yeah. So, so I'm glad you're here. So what, what here's a quality that you don't know or qualification you don't know. I have died. I um, died once. I, you died? Yes. Medically? I, or you oh, of, I died. I hovered over my body and saw the light the whole deal. Yeah. Do you, you want to start there? <laughs> I'll start wherever you want. I just did. I just realized that it's not necessarily about grief. It's also about death. And I, uh, it's on my resume. <laughs> okay. Do, do me a favor. Pull the mic uh, four inches from your face. You got, okay. you got too much. You have a perfect radio voice. I'm not okay. used to, the other people right. on the other side are usually uh, pip squeaks. Yeah. So okay. no, I'm sorry. I'm going to talk shit any my guess. I'm just talking shit. Um, so do you want to start with where you... What do you mean you died? I mean, I know what you mean, but what do you mean? Well, I was in, in Jamaica. I was in my early 20s, and I thought I was going to impress these women, and I filled myself with red stripe beer, meth, Coke, uh, Miss Jenny's cakes. She made ganja cakes. I had a uh, pot. I had, oh, my God, and the pot there is so good, and it's, it's so plentiful. I mean, the, the roaches that I would leave behind would be a big joint in Philadelphia, be a fatty as my grandmother would call it. <laughs> she, she loved to smoke pot. Roll so, me a fatty, Craig. Come right. on. So all I heard in there was, was the Jenny cakes or was it the meth? Uh, uh, it was everything. Okay, it was so. everything. It was Coke. It was, uh, uh, it was, I can't, I think I'm leaving something out of, uh, I just took everything in and I was at this reggae concert outside, a very small concert. And it was on the, like the cement area. And I passed out up here, and I went down, and my head just bounced like a bowling ball. And I got a big head anyway, so they must have, they must have thought it was a, a meteor shower. I wasn't going to say it. I'm, so, I'm glad you said it first. <laughs> I got an eight. Okay. Uh, no hats fit oh, me. Oh, you got the Barry Bonds on that. Uh, yeah, the, yeah. yeah, but he had chemical help. <laughs> yeah, 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 I've no. been this way my whole life. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, right. I've been, I've been a, a bobblehead my entire life. But uh, it, it's not easy holding this thing up. So – 
I it went bam down on the ground and I I went out. I mean, I was gone. I hovered over my body and I still remember what they said to me. Yeah, I'm a white guy. I just found out I'm 14% Ghana. But anyway, I didn't know that at the time. But uh, I hear this guy go, oh, I did mushroom tea. I forgot about that. Mushroom tea. Because that's what the quote is. The guy goes, pasty mon, did too much mushroom tea. <laughs> I'll never forget that. Hovering over my – and I finally came back. And it was the, it was the, one of the longest nights of my life. Because literally like a devil and a, like a god or angel were fighting for me. That's what went on the entire night. They were just, you know, come with me. And they're like the devil type of Satan was going, no, you're going to stay here on the island. You're going to be a burnout on the island in a trench coat. That's all you're going to have in your life. And the other one's going, no, come with me. See God. And, and it was a horrible battle that went on. And then luckily my friend came from Philadelphia the next day and kind of you know, helped me out and stuff like that. And I had, I had left my motorcycle at the reggae concert so my reputation was all over the island about this guy that died and came back. So my friend said, it was you, wasn't it? I go, yeah, it was me. So, you had to know. Yeah. So anyway, it was, so I have had a death experience. So what do you, what do you, I mean, we'll tap into, you know, a, a lot from there, but I'm just curious, what do you, what do you make of that? Do you take it as something existential or do you take it as something that your mind already created about yourself and it's a dream state or do you take it as a near death experience where, you know, well, I think it was, a, I th believe it was a death experience. There was a nurse there and she revived me and stuff. I mean, I think it was, I'm not positive. I just real, I absolutely know what happened mm -hmm. and I still have the visual of it. It's that, it's that concrete. It's mind. that it, it's, yeah, it is. And now it did not stop me. It stopped me temporarily from the partying. And, uh, but all these messages accumulate through my life and, Things about what we'll talk about later about laughter healing and these things, these messages keep coming to me. And now I'm in a position where I become aware of them and embrace them, explore them, be inspired by them. And it's led to everything that I do today. Oh, it's beautiful. The whole experience, everything, the, all the life experiences. I also tried suicide. I tried that. And I was 13. And, uh, you know, you talk about grief. I have a whole story about the grief of uh, you can, gr you don't have to have death. To grieve like right, i have sure. to grieve my childhood often because i was kidnapped by a serial pedophile i don't know where to start <laughs> i'm so happy you're here for all this but shit i don't know where to start this is I, guys tune in this is part one just to clarify that's intense man well shit that's like, it's you, not that's the thing is like that's what's wonderful about my life i made it through everything my dad left when i was born i was my dad become a cult leader i you know, all of these things are just ways that I can experience life. And then here's the part that I love is I get to share it with other people. That's why I'm here. It's not here. I'm on the planet and here with you is I share these things. People go, wow, I went through something similar or something where they can relate to it. Mm. And they go, how did he get through? And there's where my laughter healing program comes in a, a lot because well, I'm where really I, in the laughter business. That's where I relate to, and obviously not on a professional level of what you're doing with comedy, but the the coping mechanisms of humor I think is so powerful. Yeah. I don't know if it's for, I believe it could be for everyone, but it's not, you know, I'm not going to force it in anyone's throat because, you know, you take it different ways. But I think humor is a huge tool for coping for me in particular. And I want to ask you with all the things that you just mentioned, I, guess I like also that you said you can grieve other things that are not death. So I think yeah. it's, there's similar um, maybe mechanisms or similar modalities to heal through different types of grief. Exactly, yeah. But how do you, for someone who's gone through so much, I'm sure there's people listening that have different types of traumas in their life, how do you decipher whatever it is you're feeling from one trauma from another? Do you know what I mean? How do you work that out? How do you tell which is which? It's an individual process on each one. I mean, each one has had its new discoveries. Like, for instance, when I was kidnapped, I was kidnapped by this guy for five days to a ghetto hotel in Washington, D.C., this guy, Ben Rauscher. And he claimed he was going to be like a father figure for me, and he was. And then and, and he had this whole thing set up, and he, he took me away. And I couldn't, you know, I could, there was no phone. I couldn't get out. And, and it was just really... It was a horrible experience, but I didn't let, I don't let anything happen to me. I have it happen for me. So what could I learn from that? And, and I did try to commit suicide after that. I mean, I thought life was over. And it's, it's an example of how things happen that are, end up to be funny and people, it's gallows humor. Some people don't like it, but I do. Mm -hmm. I was, so I tried to hang myself and I had a bunch of neckties and I strung them together and I put them over over a door. I was 13. I hadn't hit puberty yet. I was really miserable. I just didn't want to live my life. 
and this guy had just done this to me and, and I wasn't understood at home, no father and all that kind of stuff. And I was bullied, horribly bullied, like beaten. So I just tied these things over on the doorknob and I, and I did a noose and I, and I hung there and I uh, was just gagging. And I, was, and I really was hoping that my mom would come in and she did. I was going, <clears throat> and she said, and she walks in this is typical of my mom. She goes, what are you doing? What are you doing like that? What are you? Those are new neckties. Oh my God. Get up. Would you? And, and by the way, I could get up because I was on my knees dangling from my knees and I just stood up, you know, <sighs> but it was, you know, it was more like I wanted attention or something. I wanted her to, but she made me laugh. I mean, that makes me laugh that she would think about because we were poor. So it was, I was destroying these neckties, not my life. She could care less, but the neckties, that was important. Yeah, they can't get away with the neckties, but your life, you know, that's just <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> so, and that's an example of, I look back and I do laugh about it and I hope other people laugh about it. It's not a tragedy. What happened to me with the pedophile wasn't a tragedy because I get to share it with other people who are going through something similar and who ended up taking a road that they, they do kill themselves or slowly or quickly because they can't deal with it. They can't deal with the grief that happens because that my childhood got snagged from me. Mm -hmm. So now oddly I go backwards and I'm act like a child and I love acting like a child. I have children myself and I play all the time with them. I come up with games and it's one thing they just love about me. And so I'm, I'm recreating that childhood that didn't really exist. It got taken from me like instantly. Mm. Yeah. Is that part of the healing, which is recreating yeah. that? And is that your yeah. way of healing? One, one of the ways I parent this, again, I get to be a great parent is I give them everything that I long for. It makes parenting easy because if I think to myself, like I would never long to be hit. So I don't hit them. I would never long to be, I want attention. So I give them attention. I want love. I want comfort. I want support. Those are all the things. So I just go, take a breath. One of the things I've learned, spiritus is a Latin word for breath. So I allow the breath, the breath of life, the breath of God, whatever you want to call it, the breath of universe, the breath of love. And I allow it to, I take that pause. And then my reaction is one of ethereal or divine, you know, instead of like a reaction of fear and anger and rage and all that kind of stuff. And that's how I raise them. And they, they know that. So that's in the moment. In, in that in the moment, moment of whatever you're feeling, that's yeah. when you take the breath. Mindfulness, yeah. It's really important. Mindfulness is very it's, – it's so – we live in such a society that's the opposite. It's mindless. Mm. It's constant. And I'm guilty of it. I, I start scrolling on Instagram, and it kind of knows me too. Instagram? Yeah. It's starting it's, – it's getting a little scary sometimes. Yeah, do you see advertisements for neckties? And, uh, <laughs> I will now. <laughs> now, in comedy, we call that a callback, yeah. and that was good. That was good. Yeah, I got, and I got, you had I, no fear of hurting my feelings. But that was really good. I, I like I, that. I, I, you know, I have to, you had to feel me out earlier, no pun intended again. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I felt, you know, I, it seems like you wear, your, you wear everything on your sleeve, which I respect. You know, yeah. it takes a lot of courage and vulnerability to even say what you said. And I, I've yeah. had people share experiences like that personally off the mic. Um, you know, and, and even some people might see the humor as a lack of uh, respect, this and that. But, hey, it's your experience. So, you know, I feel like that gives you a pass. But the fact that you can just talk about this openly, that is a – the the amount of impression that I get from that is just – it's tremendous. Right? Yeah, it's something I teach and coach. I have a program called Winning with Humor, and I'm here for the win, baby. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm winning now. And I lost a lot, a lot when I was growing up. I had absolute poverty, moved all – I used to think the word evict – meant move. I thought they were the same word. Here's the eviction truck, mommy. Pack up. And by the way, I still wow. keep a few boxes packed, even though I've made a lot of money and do very well. I still have that little thing where I go, hey, you don't want to completely unpack because they're going to come for you. Oh, no way. So wh what does that mean to you? It's just a little symbolic thing where I, I you know, it, it's a little hoardy, you know, a little bit. I keep souvenirs. By the way, I have souvenirs for the kids. They could give a shit. <laughs> oh, they don't care. I have all the stubs and programs from all the things I've taken them to. Oh my God. I, they've had the most amazing life for, you know, front, well, I'm always front row of the Lakers. I mean, every single game you can imagine in concerts and 
what's that slime thing? I took them to that VI. Everything's VIP. Yeah, everything's VIP for me, you know, because I'm you know, connected now because of my career. Oh, I'm sorry you're here. What a for you. <laughs> this is symbolic. Yeah. <laughs> where, where, I can where, be of where I am. But I mean, and they've had these, and they don't care. I mean, I coached all their teams, mm. always will, wanting my father to ever show up for a game and never did, not once. And I showed up for not only the games, but the practices and um, their coach and th and so on. So I was having a garage sale once. I said, hey, anything you guys want to sell, you can keep the money. They bring out their game balls. It tells you it means nothing to them. Hey, Justin, great game. Because they know it's a bunch of crap anyway. They, they didn't really have a great game. They were just next on the list to get a ball. Mm. So it's a whole other society we're living with now. We're raising the kids in a different way. But so I'm still hoarding these things, thinking they have value to them. It, it means nothing to them because souvenirs and keepsakes have no meaning. For me, they did because I was dreaming. I was wishing all the time for this life. So if I would have an autograph, someone was so meaningful for me. You know, I had Muhammad Ali's autograph wow. when I was a little kid. I was like, wow, you know, and it, it, it's but it's meaningless. And it all comes down to it. everything's meaningless. I mean, is it? I feel like ultimately things are meaningless until you give meaning to it, right? And if and yeah. the individual, I feel like these uh, seven years you're talking are like almost a physical man manifestation of your trauma. Yes, which, yes. Which has a lot of meaning to it. Yes. And if, and I still have the program of the Eagles game in Washington, D.C. And that's what the guy took me to, the kidnapper. He took me to that game. I still have the program. You would think it would be like just trauma for me. Still, I, have the, I have the program of the Eagles game playing. The, I'm an Eagles fan. Eagles playing the Washington Redskins. That's how he lured me from getting me gifts from the Eagles and still he had connections with the Philadelphia Eagles. And and oddly, by the way, here's full circle. I ended up in business with the Philadelphia Eagles. I have a TV show on Amazon Prime. Oh, man. And, and the Eagles are my partners in it. Are you kidding me? No, it's, I'm, on I'm it. just thinking this. <laughs> They're in on it. Yeah. <laughs> No, that that that's uh you know I'm trying to make light of this because I'm feeding off you right now. But it's okay. Yeah, uh, yeah. That's, there's not uh, there's not that's the thing. Nothing ever bothers me. I mean, you can consider what you've gone through, especially I, especially if you I don't know you. Yeah. Now, if you, if I knew you, maybe you know if you had a call back to something that was a pain point or whatever. But um, not much bothers me, and and I'm really happy about that because of all the grieving that takes place, all the processing all the work that takes place to get to this open space of let's uh, you and I are just connected right now. Mm. That's it. We're just connected. We're having this coming. We just met minutes ago and it's, you just, I can dive in with anyone because there's a, if, as long as they're willing, which you are, as long as they're willing to connect, mm. it's a, it's a vibration. I teach this with my course. It's a vibration and a frequency that I think we should more get into than the vibration that's out there that's false. This is a genuine vibration. I call it genuine energy flow. It's a genuine energy and it's a flow. Just like a river, it just keeps going and you're gonna find dams and rocks and impediments and all that, but it's just gonna keep going. Mm. But other people, and they're so locked into fear and their past and all of this stuff and their trauma that they stop. There's a dam that stops them and they stagnate and they don't get any better, they don't evolve. They don't transform. But we have the ability, which you do, um, you're executing in your life to transform. You took your father's tragedy, the tragedy of your father, and transformed it. You put alchemy into it and turned it into gold. You turned it into a way of being of service to others and of service to yourself. Well, thank you. Thank you, for real, because that is the ultimate goal at the end of the day. And I think that's what obviously brought us together. And I, I haven't met, you know, I haven't met many people that have had this multitude of experiences in several levels of trauma you know i think we all have maybe traumas that are on i guess it's all relative of how much what trauma means to another but into what you're talking i want to tap into the practices that you've taken in your life and what you're also teaching and putting it out there to help others as it relates to grief so when you're mentioning um you know a, a dam and people are, have this blockage to their yeah. flow of energy or whatever yeah. the river <laughs> however you put it yeah how would you relate that dam to someone that's grieving a loss I would relate it to avoidance of pain is worse than pain. And this is something I believe many people suffer from. And suffering is a choice. I don't believe people need to suffer. I think you can embrace it, move through it, 
it's not like you're like, I'm not into ignoring things or just laughing things off, but I will tell you that laughter is just, it, we're so misinformed about what laughter does. It literally changes your consciousness. So if you're just conscious of one thing, I am conscious of this person who died. I am, I'm stuck in this position. You're not allowing yourself to grow. You're not allowing yourself. And that person who died, for instance, that's not what they want for you. They want you to be happy. Somebody especially commits suicide. You think they want you to commit suicide with them, and which is a lot of what, that's a lot of places where people go. So they go, oh my God, that, that started the whole ball rolling. And we need to take that pause and reflect and change the vibration into one like, I'm going to live my life as best I can. And laughter is the most important thing to life. And I'll tell you a story when you're ready for it, but uh, about, about uh, laughter healing. How do I know I'm ready? How will you know? Um, you just tell me. <laughs> All right, give me a second. All right, I'm ready now. You can go. <laughs> what I meant by that was you might have had a question or follow-up question or somewhere you wanted to go. I'm just putting a little pin in that. And if you want it to be right now, I'll tell it right now. Let's put a pin in that. You remind us when that we can unpin that. Um, I, I like what you're saying because when you related that breath work to a – so in the moment practice of when you're maybe going to react to someone, I, I'm glad you brought that back because I did envision in my head that is a good practice of even when you're by yourself feeling a certain emotion, take a breath to not react to your own emotions, even if you are by yourself. That's correct. Yes. I, I think when, we, when I, even when I, when I think about, um, you know, responding versus reacting when it comes to a conflict or interacting with another yeah. person, I've always related to that, but I've, I've gotten better. I just never put a title to it. Like you have of when you're by yourself and you feel triggered or whatever the hell it may be, you're feeling down, you can take that same breath and react to yourself and yeah. respond to yourself yeah. as opposed to reacting to yourself. Now, when you're ready for upper level course with me, and I'll give it to you right now, I take people through a guided laughitation. Ooh. This is my thing is not about comedy. I've been a com comedian for many years at a very high level, world ranked. It's meaningless to me. All that stuff is meaning. What's, what I found is that it's the laughter that's important, not the comedy. And laughter is an act, just like uh, crying is not drama. Mm. It's a result of drama many times. But laughter is a result of comedy many times. But you can just choose to laugh. So I take, if you could choose to meditate, I can take you through a guided laughitation, and it, which is an entirely different experience where you, you literally transform whatever your situation you're in. It's holding you back. It's blocking you from your own happiness, your own joy, and I can make that happen instantly. You want to do one? Yeah, this is great. What, the, what, what do I got to think about, my dad? No, 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 no. I'll show you how it works. Okay. So you do this along with me. I'll, I'll go first, okay? I'll go first. And it's really easy. What do I do with my hands? Yeah, you can do anything okay. with your hands. <laughs> he put himself in the, in the, in the traditional meditation. I saw post. you do something. So I was like, do I got to circle him up? No, 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 you can do that if you okay, want. Okay. You just wave him in the air. It doesn't okay. matter. What <laughs> matters is the laughter. Hmm. And you can choose to laugh. Take out of your mind, you're like a jackass or whatever it is. Oh, this is stupid. You know, all those messages that we see. What are you laughing at back east? What are you laughing at? Yeah, I'm laughing at life, okay? Is that all right with you? You know what I mean? It's like, you know, you're so silly. How we're just put away from our laughter. That's our greatest expression of joy. What a great thing to do. Why are we putting it away? Because people are threatened by it. They're threatened by your joy and your fulfillment. So you can take that out and then do, 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 a, do a breath in through your nose. We'll start and let out a ha. Ha is a very cleansing breath, by the way. Feel the cleansing. By the way, t measure yourself right now is how I do it usually. Like a uh, one to 10 scale of uh, like tension, anxiety. So let's say you're like at a seven now, right? That's a pretty good guess, actually. Uh, yeah, okay, seven. So you're at a seven, you know, because things on your mind and stuff like that. So I'm going to take it down to at least a four by doing this, okay? This is great timing because I, uh, I popped both my tires on the 405 yesterday, so it was great. Oh, oh, that's perfect to use in this. I'm okay. Actually, my car's getting fixed right now. Just remember that. Okay, remember that when we get to you. I'm going to do mine first. I'll do a real quick one. These are real quick ones because I know we don't have a lot of time here. So breathe through your nose and let out a ha. Ha. Oh, good. That was good and resonant. That's great. That ha is very expressive. You know, and even in if you go to like a, a church or hallelujah, it's, it's a very spiritual word, the word ha. That was a good ha? Yeah, it was a good ha. I usually have to work with people. They just say, hey, leave it up here. Ha. Okay. But you had a nice resonant feeling the vibration. You're feeling the vibration inside of you. And let's do another one. Let out a... 
Did you feel that? You let that all out. Okay. My shoulders dropped. Yeah, exactly. Same with mine. Okay. Now we're going to do a, we're going to add a ha ha. Okay. <laughs> Ready? <laughs> See, you're laughing already. Good. That's a great expression. Here we go. Ha 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 You said how high. You said, I know. Wow. I added a few. All right. It's an energy thing. It's an exchange. And by the way, you're laughing now. There's no jokes whatsoever. You see how it works? <laughs> That's good. Okay. Let's do another one. Into your nose and. Ah. <laughs> it's contagious. Okay. See, it's contagious. You're not even thinking about it. There's no thoughts or fears going on in your mind when you're laughing like that. Okay. Now we're going to continue the laughter. See, I know it's exhausting because we don't exercise. You no, know I'm saying it's hot. My my edit, Jeff, you, he's put this light right above my head, but yeah. Well, I mean, you're gonna feel the heat bound because now this is a vibration of frequencies That's going great. through yeah. your body. Okay, now now I'm gonna start and I'll do my first one. Okay, I'm not done. Uh, now, no, 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 okay. no. I know it's exhausting. <laughs> no, it's good. It's oxygenating your body. Your heart is pumping. This is so good for you. People lose weight on this. This is so many things that are happening for you all at once just through laughter. Your lungs are engaged, which I know. Is it's difficult, you know, sometimes because we keep things closed in our lungs or we smoke or whatever we do and we're putting that away. But now you're releasing through this laughter. Now I want you to, I'm going to add in something that's in my way. Okay. Just like you're going to add in the, the tires. Okay. Right. Watch how it works. You just laugh along with me. Here we go. My, <laughs> my wife joined a cult. <laughs> She moved out in the middle of the night <laughs> and took the kids. <laughs> I came back from a trip, <laughs> expected her to pick me up at the airport. <laughs> she said, read your email. <laughs> And stole all the money from the house I bought. <laughs> okay, now Wait. breathe through your nose. Let out a ha. Let out a ha. Cleansing ha. <sighs> now I'm just gonna check in with you. Did you take it down from a seven? Check in with yourself. Solid five. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. We're going to make it even more so. We're going to take it down even more because you're going to go now. I almost feel lightheaded. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. You're exercising parts of your body, okay, and your mind and your spirit that you get exercised every day, all right? <laughs> Here we go. We're going to do it again. There we go. All right. And now you're going to go. You're going to talk. Just pick whatever you want to pick, some tragedy, something that's getting in the way of your complete freedom to take it down to a one. There's, <sighs> something, there's something that's bothering you, that, right? Here we go. Here we go. And in through your nose. <laughs> I almost died yesterday. No way. I blew both my tires with a 405. <laughs> I was going 70 and it's somehow the car stayed in this lane. <laughs> no way. I earned at least $2,500. <laughs> All right. Oh, into your fuck. nose. Into your nose. Without a ha. ha. Now. I'm good. Yeah. That was nice. Yeah, isn't that nice? Oh, I'm a little dizzy, but that feels good. Yeah, well, you're, you're, just, you're engaging parts of you that don't get engaged every day. Yeah, but how do people do that without you? Like, I know people can do that, but, like, you're really... I uh... take them through, especially if they do the course. I take them through, or they... One-on-ones, I do one-on-ones. I have a thing called chuckle chatter. It's a little easier. But what it does is... If you think, yeah, it's it's intense. If you think right now, all that stuff is meaningless. That's you bring everything to the meaning. You had a lot of meaning on it. Almost died, and this is going to cost me this. When you're saying the amount of cost, it doesn't mean anything. Mm. When you're saying this and expressing it in a way that's positive and a positive vibration, it doesn't mean anything except for being in the now. Now you're present. You're aware. You're hanging with me. We're having fun. It's probably going in a different direction you were planning on going with interviewing this comedian you don't know. <laughs> well, I mean, I feel like an asshole talking about my flat tires and you just want to a cult <laughs> <laughs> is, that, is that true? That's the true? It is all true, Okay. Yeah. I'm going to tap into that in a second. <laughs> no. Does this have long-term, is this long-term benefits or is it just, is it both of uh, in the moment 
feeling better as well as long-term benefits of healing uh, through something? Well, in, in any practice that you have, it's always long-term benefits the more you practice. So if you practice this, this is why we have a number of people that just took the last course. We're releasing a new one. And all of those people are like friends now because we have these shared experiences, which are wonderful and they're dark and light. And But we mostly, we go to the light because now they have a practice. They have an exercise, just like if you're getting physical good shape, what are you going to do? Lift weights. So now we're doing our serenity squats or whatever serenity we're doing. Squats. I'm just kidding. Okay. I'm sorry. I'm saying, <laughs> I'm like, we're doing our laughter lunges. Okay. What I'm saying, trying to say is we are doing a workout here yeah. that is covering parts of our consciousness and our body and our mind that's usually not covered if you're just doing physical activity lifting weights or whatever it is that's great for the physical but we're all mind body and spirit together and if you can get all those things together in unison man life is beautiful and this is a way this is a way to get there it's a fast pathway to that it's like a the bullet train so just relate to my initial question of how do you relate the the dam and the blockage to grief is this a way of you just unblocked, right? Right. It, Let's it, say you had grief saying. over the almost getting killed yesterday. So you just released it. It, it means nothing to you right now. Right. But now you will walk out of here and go, I got that bill to pay still, but whatever. Yeah, yeah. I mean, but in the moment, no, it's not there. But how does that work with, because obviously a tire who gives a shit, but like when it comes to losing someone, that is a dam that you probably have to chip away at, right? It, you, it, you do. Uh, yes. It has to be chipped away, but the practice, it becomes reality for you that the person is gone but how's your response they i've said it before i said it before even here is they don't want us to suffer or have pain because of their because of them leaving the planet we're all going to leave sometime so that acceptance that amount of i also talk about this in the course is the amount of acceptance i have people list what they can't accept and that's pretty heavy because and by the way that's where all comedy comes from it's lack of acceptance it's conflict so you have an inner conflict or an outer conflict, and these are things you can't accept. I can't accept people that talk in movie theaters. I go out of my or talk loud when I'm about to fly and they're in the other seat and we're not taking off yet and they're having this conversation. I'm like, hey, buddy, you know, he can hear you without the phone. You know, I can't so accept when I hold the door for someone. They just walk by me without a little boom, thank you. Boom, exactly. You know? But see, I relate to that. And I laugh at that. I smile when you said it because that's what I have people list those things and people, yeah, me too. So now we know, now we're, we're all in this together. Yeah. So when you have a lonely situation, when you're grieving someone, it's a very specific lonely thing. When you're involving other people, now you know you're not alone, which is a big issue with mental health because you always think you're alone with mental health. Then when you have other people going, me too, me too, me too, all that, that's how people relate to one another. That's how we have a divine connection with one another like no other. And that's where laughter gets us. <sighs> explodes right through that crap so when did you start applying this because i, I want to tap into any specific experience besides the cult thing because that's interesting well this is the pin that we were putting in. i can get to where i came up with this with, with oh, how you was yep. this a part of an experience that you had yes this is specific a, to one of the things you mentioned everything by the way i'm going to teach you about comedy if you ever want to be a comedian i tried stand up recently for the first time the best lesson i i teach that as well the best lesson i ever got was an accidental lesson when i said everybody said you should have a sitcom Gianni said it on the way here. He goes, yeah, man, everybody thinks you should have a sitcom. I, I've been hearing this since I was 20. Yeah. And I'm not 20 anymore. So, yeah. And the difference is what changed my life and career is because everybody had a sitcom back in the 90s. That's how, you got, that's how you needed that, right? Yeah, I needed this guy to say this to me. It was like an intervention. He goes, I was killing on stage. I'm like, what, how come... How come Tim Allen and Seinfeld and Drew Carey, they all have sitcoms. How come they have sitcoms and I don't? Even people you've never heard of had sitcoms in the 90s. They were giving them out. He says, because you don't have a point of view. And I said, what, me? what about me? What about a show about a guy without a point of view? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like I start arguing. He said, you can argue all you want. That's the, that's the word in Hollywood. So then I looked at that as a lesson. And from that point forward, I share my experiences, not my opinions. Mm. You even mentioned it earlier. These are my experiences and nobody can deny it. They can be angry all they want. They're just projecting or something with them, but they can't argue with my experiences. And I have many that are all part of my life now. Those ex I use those experiences for the betterment of my life and others. And so the, the story I was going to tell you is there are moments in life where we have to take that 
spiritus, that breath. You just got to go. Like, and that was a reflective moment. Changed my life. Everything I do now, my books that I came out with, all my stand-up, everything's experiential. And I love it. He can't deny it. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, this is my life. And so years ago, I was hanging out with this one of my best friends, Michael Goldberg, and he wrote Cool Runnings. He wrote Little Giants. We really bond in comedy together. We watched Philadelphia Eagles games together. We had a whole troop of us and just had so much fun. And his, uh, he wanted, his wife wanted to get pregnant, and they couldn't. And I, and I said to them, I said, you know, a lot of people get pregnant after my comedy show. <laughs> it happens. All, all these people tell me. I, I, I do this character, the love master, and I guess I'm setting them up, and you knock them down. Yeah. <laughs> so they go home, and they try, yeah, baby, I'm the love master, baby. Oh, yeah. So that's where I'll take you to a wet lab in Wuhan, baby. I'm the love master. There's three baby. guys in the room right now. Don't worry. You, you <laughs> it's getting a little creepy. Right yeah. <laughs> a little creepy. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. So I said, so, so a lot of guys go home and they do that after my show. And they, it sounds like Kermit the Frog. I'm, I'm the love master. Whatever it is. Now the woman is laughing. They're laughing. I have this really beautiful connection through laughter. They just see my show. And now, at least five people told me they got pregnant. And some were told they couldn't get pregnant. So I told Golds and Karen this. We were filming the movie The Love Master in Arizona. He was the director. And sure enough, I left the room. I said, I'll go get sandwiches. I came back. He had done this already. And baby Kayla was born nine months later. What, what is, what's going on? What it does is, is it's taking out all the tension of trying to have a baby or trying to make sure that the sex is the best and all this kind of stuff. And it's just loosening everything up. You're laughing. You're just having fun. You're out of outcome. You're out of results, which is very important. I teach that as well. Then a uh, year and a half later, he got brain cancer. They have this baby girl, a year and a half old, and they said, you have three months to live. And that was one of the moments in my life where I went, does laughter, is it really the best medicine? Is this a bunch of crap? Are you a healer yourself by doing comedy? I had all this examination. And I called my friend who runs an aftercare facility for cancer patients. And I said, I'm going to get there with other friends of Gold's, Team Gold's, we, you know, nicknames Gold's. He showed up for all of it. I developed this whole Laugh for Life program with the guy to Lavitation, all of it. And all the prescriptions were go see comedy shows, go to movies, whatever it was. Hey, let's exchange them. All these cancer patients and their caregivers showed up for this. He showed up so much. I, 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 he came to comedy shows. I had a restraining order. He came to so many shows. <laughs> so he came three months to live. They said, get your act, you know, everything in order. He lived 15 years past that prognosis. Wow. 15 years because he had a will to live because he was laughing and having a, the best time that he could. Even these horrible conditions, he was pronounced dead, like, or supposed to die all the, through the years. Go say goodbye to him. Nope. There he is again. There Golds pops up again, laughing away, having a good time. Tragedies didn't matter. Everything was laugh, 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 and have a good time. And even he ended up in hospice and he was in a coma. And he was, I, we filmed this for a movie called Laughter Heals about the, I formed the nonprofit Laughter Heals in Gold's name and came up with all these things because of Gold's. He was my inspiration. I wanted him to be alive. I love the guy. So much fun, so smart and a Philly fan. Anyway, so <laughs> I, uh, I went to his bed and we filmed this so you can see if it's real. And he was in a coma, complete coma. He had no idea I was there. I was waving my hands in front of him. Gold, do you even know it's me? He's just staring and staring. You know, you could tell life was coming out of him. I said, what can I do for you, Gold? I don't know what to do. And I leaned in and I said, you want me to jerk you off? <laughs> I said, I'd never done anybody but my own, but I'm really good with myself. Can I give you a handy? He came out of a coma and he goes, <laughs> Are you shitting me? Yeah, he came out of a coma and he laughed. I said, I have a photo of it. I just saw it the other day. Came out of, and he passed away three, two or three days later. Wow. But I made him laugh on his deathbed. You didn't go through with it, right? Huh? You didn't go through with it, right? No. <laughs> <laughs> See, you're good. <laughs> you're good. You're conscious. You're good. That's how you come up with these callbacks. That's great. Uh, no, that's, that's I, I did not. I, I, I might have, I might have, I had to clarify, but I didn't want to just leave that there out there. There's a way of uh, averting the question. You there. know? No, that's beautiful. Not that it would be wrong. No, no, no there's but nothing wrong with no, that. No, I did not do that. I, um, I probably did myself. I, no, no. <laughs> That'd be even no, weird. No. That might actually be weirder. Yeah, exactly. Yes. <laughs> you know? Way weirder, yeah. So he came out. He literally was dead-ass in a coma when, when you said that. and he Staring. 
just staring into nothingness. And he then popped out of it. Popped out, and he goes, <laughs> and he just laughed. And he actually stayed out of it after that, which was, we were, you know, we really had a conversation. And, you know, again, we filmed it for the movie. We're trying to uh, make a movie about this. He's the inspiration, but we want to take seven patients with various illnesses through these laughter programs and monitor the results. It's never been done before. There's certainly studies, a lot of clinical studies, a lot. I don't know if you knew that. Uh, proof that laughter really does work in your healing and grieving. Mm. And um, also uh, Norman Cousins cured himself of a, of a terminal illness by locking himself in a room with three stooges and candid camera, but it shows it's subjective. Some people don't think three stooges are funny. Most women. Right. So, and so, but laughter is not subjective. This is why I teach laughter, not comedy. It's a big difference. So he did that and that's what made him laugh. And he, I think he was 30 years past his prognosis. And then Norman Cousins, I mean, and then uh, Patch Adams, that was, now, that was the first thing I was thinking. Here's the thing with Patch Adams. If you show up in my hospital room with a clown outfit, n nothing against him. It's great work that he's doing. I'm going to pull the plug. I don't want to live. <laughs> I want to see a guy with fake shoes, big shoes or whatever. Yeah. You know, they're creepy to me. And a lot of people think that clowns are creepy. So that's why they say with Laughter Heals, we raise money. They say, well, do you have clowns that go to the hospitals for the kids? They go, no, 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 we don't do that. We don't do that. We supply uh, their own method of getting to the laughter spot to getting that be that better place. Yeah, and I don't have any scientific backings of my own experience. I just know I, how I feel when I laugh. Yeah. And I think yeah. without any data points, I would I make sense of everything you're saying. Yeah. But I would love to tap in real quick. So Did you take it down, by the way? You were at a seven? You're, yeah, you're yeah. down, I, right? I forgot my car was in the shop. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for bringing me back out to an eight. Um, but no, outside of that, I, what, I know you're, uh, you have a hard out, but what, what is your experience with your personal grief with him? Like, do you, what, do you, what do you recall from that? That's a very good question. Never been asked that before, so I'm going to have to pause and think about what my reaction is yeah, yeah. In, in the moment. Um, my, my take on Golds is that he was an inspiration that I can use to this day and pass that on. And all of these situations were all an opportunity for that growth to be able to now have this coursework, have the one-on-one. -on -one. I'm, I'm really, and I get to help people not just by making them laugh on a stage anymore, which I still do at a high level. It's wonderful when people come up and say, that's the best comedian I've ever seen. Oh my God, I cried till I, my jaw, I love when their jaw hurts. I do a long show. Mm. My face hurts. I got Bell's palsy. That's what I want. <laughs> I want to give people Bell's palsy, but that's temporary. I like to give them the skills and the tool set to be able to access themselves through the pathway of laughter. This is something that no one's teaching. And I decided this is what I'm going to teach. I'm shifting away from, you know, personal happiness of making people laugh and the comedy shows. I'm really not into attention except for if that leads to me to more of an audience to teach mm. and coach and mentor. And I've got the whole tools. These, it's really cool, like this whole step program that it came out of me. And, and you know, like I was like, named the Comedian of the Year American Comedy Awards and the former other winners are just hugely famous. And I, one of the top comedians of all time, specials of all time, all that. All that leads to for me is for credibility to know that I know what I'm talking about when I can make anyone funny, by the way. Anyone can make anyone funny through this and this is, of Emmy Awards, and Community of the Year, American Comedy Awards, this is my greatest achievement of my life. And that stems from loss. Yeah. I mean, you've been through a lot, but. No, it all, it all stems from these traumas that I have been through. And now I chose to be the Sherpa for people to go up this mountain together. I've been, I'm not going to force them to do, do a certain area, but I'm going to tell them there's a hole there. They can still step in the hole. Hey, there's a boulder coming at you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make you aware of these things. But I can't make you, you know, have the right uh, action steps. I can just tell you where I've been, and then you can go from there and do these exercises to make you more fit spiritually, emotionally, mentally. I mean, that's the thing with, uh, with grief is when you see that boulder come in, it's constant for a lot of people. They don't see – they only see is the boulder for a while, and it's hard to see – the end of the tunnel, you know what I mean. So it's, what's your what, what do you what's your take on people that are listening that may be grieving, that just literally feel like laugh they can't handle any laugh, like they don't see any light of the end of the tunnel. That laughter's not even possible. That's not where I'm at right now. Yeah. First of all, I just want to say I get it, and I have complete empathy and compassion 
complete. However, I also know that there's an answer that you probably don't want to see right now. It all has to do with fear. You're just in fear. You have fear of the unknown or fear of res results not being what you want. But a lot of times those results are exactly what you need. And I found that all through my life is, look, did I want to be beaten up as a kid? I was beaten as a kid. I was very tiny and and it was all awful, and especially eighth grade. It just, it was like torture. They came into my house after me. There was no protection. There was no parents there. Did I want any of this stuff to happen? Absolutely not. Did I want people to die? My dad just died about uh, three months ago. Three months. Yeah. Do I want these things to happen? No, of course not. But that's that's life and that's death. And there has to be a level of acceptance, which I also talk about when I'm teaching. Is that level of, if you get into radical acceptance, you can now transform yourself to get in a better energetic space to be able to handle everything, including death. By the way, someone else could die, you know, that's close to you today. Then you get two in a row. Then you get a third one. You, you don't know. You're powerless over, over that. But what we do have power over is, is our techniques that we develop on handling these things so we don't stay in a place of suffering, which affects other people, by the way. People's grief affects other people. Mm -hmm. If you stay in that darkness and don't wish to get out of it and don't look to laugh and don't wish to have joy and have that manifest in your life, how many people are affected by that? I want to remind you that you were affected by my laughter. Were you not? 100%. Were you thinking about any grief at that time you were laughing? Anything? Not until I asked the question. No. <laughs> no. Yeah. no. You were just thinking you were in the moment. Yeah. And in that moment, the people are still dead, <laughs> but you're alive. I mean, that's a very important lesson. I mean, you've mentioned serenity earlier. It makes me think of this silly serenity prayer. But in regards to uh, focus, I think that is important with grief is focus on what you can control. Yes, and you can control your actions. You can participate in things. You connect with people. This is why they have grief recovery. I happen to know the person who wrote the grief recovery handbook. He passed away last year, John James. And uh, his son, Cole James, used to work for me. He has the Grief Recovery Institute, by the way, if you want to look them up. And, um, but the one component they don't really get into is the laughter. And I get it. I, I get it. it. Some people, some people just want to cry and they just think uh, there's all these accepted norms. And here's one thing. And you, I know you're this way from talking to you before we came on. We ain't normal. We don't want to accept norm. I, I don't want any television shows to feed or you know, media to feed me what I'm supposed to think and feel. No, you're not going to control my thoughts. So they're going to tell you that laughter is not good, that you're supposed to be crying, that you're suppo not supposed to mention this, that, or that. No, that's what they're going to tell you. It keeps you in a position where then they're going to sell you temporary medications mm -hmm. instead of the medication we have inside of us. We, it all exists in here. It's a pharmacy in us. So they're not going to tell you that. There's no laughter lobby in Washington, believe me. <laughs> I wish there was. I wish there was much more importance in laughter. And a lot of people that are watching this, probably 90% of people watching this think that I'm full of it. But I'm here for the 10% that are going, hey, man, that sounds like a good option to me because I'm tired of waking up depressed. So I'm going to tell you another story that I put a pin in. My friend Tony Luke. He's kind of famous in Philadelphia. I don't know if you ever heard Tony Luke's uh, a lot of restaurants. They're big into cheese steaks and. Oh yeah, Tony Luke's. Yeah, I was, I was like zoned out for a second. There, there you like, go. Tony Luke, yeah, why does that sound familiar? Yeah, yeah. Of so course. Tony Luke Jr. is an old friend of mine from Philadelphia, and uh, it's a very talented guy, actor. He's been in a number of movies and musician and stuff like that. It's his son passed away from uh, overdose, and I've never seen anybody grieve like that. It was it was bad. It was sorrow and just. That's all he could think about. Everything was about his son's death. You know, and there's also the guilt and all that that comes with it as well. What else could I have done? All the, you know, especially if you're a parent, you lose a child. That's a, probably the most, that's the most difficult in my opinion. So um, I called him up after a year of listening to absolute grief, 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 and sorrow, sorrow, sorrow. This is what he was. He wasn't anything else but that. And I said, Tony, you know, I had the, the gall and the, balls to say, listen, okay, this is not what your son wants. He doesn't want you to just dedicate your life to recovery when you're not even in recovery, you know, from addiction. He has nothing to share. He's, he's not in recovery. He's trying to tell people that it's about recovery. I said, Tony, it's bullshit. I'll tell you what you can do. You can bring joy to yourself and then bring joy to others. I said, I'm going to train you how to be a comedian. 
He's in Philadelphia. I said, what are you talking about? I'm not a comedian. You're good at it. I'm, 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 I can't do that. He goes, Tony, where do you think my training came from? I mean, there's no train to be a comedian. There's no, there's, nobody has any sort of background that leads to being a comedian. Anyone can be a comedian. Anyone can access their true humor. We have this in Winning with Humor. It's every single person could be funny if you follow these techniques. I said, Tony, to follow these techniques, watch. So I had him do the writing that is necessary. And it's not about jokes. It's about really this discovery, this self-discovery, and I have the pathway to do that. And he did it. And I flew to Philadelphia. I said, you can open for me. You're going to open for me at a comedy club. You know, sold out comedy club. Helium's one of the top clubs in the country. And he goes, I can't do this. I go, yes, you can. And the rehearsal the night before, we went to this restaurant. He's friends with the owner. There's only two other customers and six of us. My son was there and his friends we were, he, he went up on this little stage with a rolled up napkin, a cloth napkin with a fork and spoon and knife inside, right? And that was his microphone. He's up there gesturing with the Italian gestures that he does. And I said, yeah, and he's doing this whole act. He's really into doing it. We were howling till I had blood coming out of my eyes. I was laughing so hard. Do you know why I was laughing? At how bad he was going to bomb. <laughs> <laughs> We were losing it. If he does this tomorrow, this is going to be the worst bomb in history. And, we're, and every joke he would tell, he thought he was killing with us. We were killing him. Oh, my God. Don't do that, Joe. Don't do that. Dear, dear. Oh, my God. It was became one of those slow motion movies. No, don't do it. It was one of the funniest nights of my life was watching him bomb on this with two people the, and, uh, and the six of us. Man, was that funny. He didn't know. Well, I didn't tell him, though. I didn't want him to have doubt. Go get him, Tony. So I, I packed house, helium. I'm not exaggerating. It was the greatest comedy debut I've ever seen in my life. Really? He killed it. Something happened. Magic happened. He was healed. He's in the healing process now because it was for his son, and that inspired him. And he was able to help other people who might be grieving in the audience. Most people are grieving about something. He got the light now. And every joke he told that did well, you would just watch his whole energy shift into this positive. To the end, he was cocky. Hey, everybody. It was unbelievable. <laughs> he ended up opening for me in casinos, Borgata, Hard Rock. We have a television show together. Oh, shit. And he says on the show, it's called Comedy Kitchen, where he teaches famous comedians how to do a dish for the judges. I teach famous chefs how to do comedy for the judges. It's a role reversal challenge that we have. Where they go, oh, my guy's better than you. My woman's better than your, whatever it is. And it's, it's, we had so much fun filming this thing. We're going to film more. And he says on camera, he goes, laughter healed my life. And now he gets to live his life. He's got a record contract for music and he's killing it. And it all happened because of that. <sighs> that it's, that's like, uh, it's come a full circle for me to hear that story because I've always believed in that. As I mentioned earlier about how humor's helped me. And that is, I, I back that in so many ways. It's so nice to actually hear a story like that, that, show some proof in the pudding, you know what I mean? Because mine's like all anecdotal. I haven't done act like actual work like that. Yeah. So to hear the, how much laughter can help, I'm so happy can, people can hear that and actually learn a little bit, a little bit more about, what did you, you call it, the, the, the thing we did? Guided laughitation. Guided laughitation. Or chuckle chatter. That's the easier one. I kind of like chuckle chatter. Like, I'll tell you know, how chuckle chatter is. alliteration. Works. Chuckle chatter is really easy. It, uh, you don't have to say the difficult things. You just say what you did this morning, right? I'll show you how it works. You, just, and you, you laugh speak. Mm. And it shifts your energy. Okay, I got up and I had a shake with powder, protein powder in it. I put it on high and spun my kids close their ears. And I drank it. <laughs> See, no jokes. Doesn't have to be funny. And that was what I did this morning. You can do the same thing. It's, it's that simple. And you say it with laugh speak. And everything else goes away. All anxiety. You literally can't be depressed while you're laughing. I've tried it before. I have audiences go, I'm depressed. <laughs> At that moment, you're not. Yeah. Can't be. It's impossible. Physically impossible. So I have to ask you, because I feel like it was glazed over. And I know we're tapping out on time right now. But real quick, you, you mentioned you lost your dad three months ago. Yeah. Let me simply ask you, how are you feeling? Oh, I, I have... Um, no feeling of grief whatsoever, like zero. I was, it surprised me how much I did feel in the moment because 
you know, he was literally, he left when I was born. Like something I said, wah, he's gone. <laughs> so anyway. Might have been the wah, wah. I, 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 yeah, I threw the second wah yeah, in yeah, yeah. the big mouth. And, uh, but I had such a healing with this guy, such a, my mom as well, she's still alive and she just came to visit me. These healings that take place are miraculous. I come from a place of, you know, resentment and silent treatments and still goes on with my sister. You know, I, I can't help it. You know, I can't help her silent treatment that that's how she treats her grief and her pain. And other people do the same thing. They don't want to hear something else, an alternative to their narrative. And that's what I offer. I offer truth. And some people aren't into that. And my dad, I full cleansing. And I ended up in charge of his, even though he went off and just could care less about anything that I ever did. I mean, I shouldn't say that. He, you know, he showed up at a couple shows through the years and had a harem. Of, you know, my dad was a cult leader as well. He had a, <clears throat> what he called his harem of we have 14 women. And he's a narcissist. And, you know, with a narcissist, they're never going to say, how are you doing? So those dreams, I had to let go of those dreams and just be in acceptance. He's not going to say, how are you? Mm. And when we get into that level of acceptance with people and understand this is as good as it's going to get, so... Forget the visions you have of somebody being a better mother or a better father, whatever it was. So clean, just very clean. And when he passed, I ended up handling his affairs and all that. <laughs> not not his, his women, but I handled all of his financial stuff. And he was in a home. I had it, you know, took care of I paid the home and he had dementia. And it was better that he left anyway because he was in, never, not one speck of his life would ever get better from that point forward. Once he had the dementia, it just kept getting worse and worse. So... It was actually a relief. And I cried a bit more than I thought I would because I never really lived with him. I lived one summer with him one time. but And because everything would be about longing for what could have been, and, and that's ridiculous to play that game for ourselves. You know, we just want to make ourselves better and, uh, and then pass that on to other people, including my family. My children get the benefit from it. And by the way, they don't all show up laughing with me. I go... One that hardly speaks to me, and I have to get an acceptance about it. That's his own pain. It's his own process. It's his own journey. And I have, I did my best, coached all the teams, and took them all these experiences, and I just, I there's nothing else I can really do. And that's the thing is, you know, when you get into control, which we all have, you know, I'm going to control. He's, he needs to feel differently about me. He needs to do this. He needs to no. Mm -hmm. The more I let go, the more chance he has of coming back. Yeah, that, that especially what you just said reminded me of a. I mean, it's a, a lot of books I've read mentioned it, but the first one was the um, was the power of the subconscious by Joseph Murray. He talks about like how the, the willpower and that forcefulness is actually sometimes working against you. Yes, and, and that's why it's so important to let go, which is easier said than done. Um, that's very much. Yeah, I'm going much. through it right now. I just lost a, or I shouldn't say I lost. I, there was a big contract that was in front of me, and I started getting into it with these people. And I couldn't understand it. And I'm, I'll tell you flat out, they're dishonest. Mm. And I was blowing back, you know, calling them on their dishonesty. Where do you think that went? Yeah, well. <laughs> you know, yeah. they're going to protect themselves and they're going to try to sway it in a different direction and make it about me and come up with something about me. And I, and I would get angry. I go, what do you, did you just say that? I said to the guy, did you just say that? You think that's the truth? And I put him on speakerphone. Listen, everybody. I wanted witnesses, and I spent days of anxiety of my life, wasting my life on this, mm -hmm. and yesterday I let go, and today they came back with a contract with a, with a kill fee, and I'm fine with it, and I let go because sometimes rejection is really protection. Yeah, it's, prote it's protecting us from something, and what if I got involved with these scam artists? What if I got fully involved, which I was willing to do? I was doing that. And I got to look at it that way sometimes. It's like, you know, sometimes you got to walk away and be okay with it because life is just going to go on anyway, yeah. with or without them. or It's, it's going to go on, period. So probably it's a good idea that it happened now and not when I was way deep in with them as part of their family, basically, and good thing. And now there's a new opportunity that will open up. Maybe I'll be in business with you. There you go. <laughs> That's how it happens, especially when something uh, what you see as bad happening from the beginning. Sometimes you got to give it a little bit of time because it ends up being a blessing down the road. So not always. Sometimes it might just really just fucking sucked. Yeah. But a lot of times it seems the worst thing now and ends up being better later. But um, my wife leaving 
was an opportunity for growth. You know what I did with her? I was going to Hawaii with the kids. We have a 50-50 with the kids, which goes pretty well. That's one good thing. Because she's been, she's been literally programmed by this scam artist that she got involved with, this woman, Brooke. And she listened to this woman pontificate, you know, a lot of man-hating, leave your husbands, get your sovereign freedom, get out of your golden cage. By the way, I love to be in a golden cage. Uh, yeah. yeah, I wouldn't mind being. She would literally cry, I'm in a golden cage. I'm like, really? <laughs> Let's switch. <laughs> I love the switch. I'll be in a cage all day if it's lined impressed. with gold and I can have anything I want. But um, I was on my way to Maui and she happened to be there visiting her sister. And this ethereal light came through me. That's what speaks to me often. And then the dark comes in too. It's just like Star Wars. That's why it's such a beautiful tale is, is like, this is this energy force. The force is with us. It's an energy is a positive force. It's not aggressive. It's responsible. It's accountable and all these things. Okay. But this, our society's built the opposite. Don't be responsible, cast blame, be a victim. We're in a victim society. And I said to myself, or this, this, this source said to me, no, you, you take all of this on and be accountable and write her a note. And the note to one page, two pages, handwritten, every single thing, not one speck of I did this because this, because there's no blame whatsoever, no victim. And what came out of me was 22 handwritten pages. Wow. Single spaced of absolute accountability, responsibility, how I drew this in, whatever it was. And by the way, obviously, she's pretty wrong on doing some of these things, especially leaving her family for the, for this crazy woman stealing money from, yeah, obviously those are pretty bad things. But what did I do to draw that in? That was part of the letter, the acceptance level that I wasn't at trying to tell her what to do, you know, all those things that's going to force not good things. So I arrived in Hawaii, Maui, and I said, uh, I texted her. I said, there's a, a note at the front desk of the hotel that I'm staying with the kids. If you're into the note, we'll be at the pool. If you're not, then just take the note for what it is. And she says, she texted me, I'm at the pool. I'm halfway through the first page and I'm crying. And then it took her like a long time to read it. And then she got together with us. And we had the most extraordinary time, completely cleansed, out of trauma, both of our traumas, letting go, no control. Because I allowed that space by doing that. So it allowed her to apologize. It allowed her to show up and be present. And we had an amazing time in Maui. Spent dinner and charades, played with her, her sister was there. All this happened because of coming from that space of laughter as well. I mean, we laughed together. We played games with the kids and the kids were never that happy in all in this, since this divorce. They haven't been this happy. And, and it was, a, it's, a, it's just a better way to go is to be responsible, especially with our grief, be responsible for it. See how you're bringing it on yourself or how you're buying into other people's messages that you're supposed to be sitting Shiva or whatever it is. All these messages that they bombard us with you need to challenge it. You know, don't laugh or don't be silly. Wipe the smile off your face. That's another one, right? Why am I wiping the smile off my face? It's the stupidest thing I've ever heard, but people say it like it's nothing. I'll wipe it for you. Isn't that ridiculous? It is. It is Wouldn't you ridiculous. rather do the hang like we had today? We'd laugh. We have exchanges. We, we went sorrow. We went sad. But yeah. we, we, but at the bottom line of it is, we're just we're having a good time. Yeah. We're 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 in our connected state. Hundred percent. And that's what we want to be. I mean, I think that's why it was so easy to talk to you. If you don't know any of my friends, it's uh, even when we're going all through our own shit. It's always bust and balls. Always getting laughs out even oh yeah and that's and that's like i said that's been part of my healing so i, I resonated with in so many less practical ways it's been natural ways yeah. um but i'm impressed with what you're doing i'm i want to thank you again for being here yeah um and before i would love to plug I, i'm going to share all your information on the bottom but about before you plug yourself or feel free to plug yourself i want to give you any any last words that you want to drop right now just uh feel free i i, I just want to challenge people to challenge yourself to not accept the norms because it's not normal it, but they say that it's normal. The pursuit of happiness is absolute crap. There's, we're not pursuing happiness. You can't show me one single place in the mass media or government that's about your happiness. It's all about deflection. It's about lies and deceit. So I ask everyone, don't do it for me. Do it for yourself. This is what I did. I just stopped watching the news. 
I choose those times to reflect, be mindful, be conscious, and laugh my ass off and find other people to laugh with. And that's what I would leave people with. I think that uh, you can shift. You can shift out of your grief and into something that the person who's passed away or even your childhood, it's in the past. Let's stay present. And that's what I would say to everybody. And you can go follow me. Take my course. It actually uh, is. When's this coming out? Is it coming out soon? Uh, either I'm this Friday or next latest. Oh, great, great. Latest. So if it's coming out soon, we are, of course, uh, the second version la launches in July. It's a chance to join into the group. We're starting a laugh mob. And we're, we're going to shift the world one laugh at a time. You know what I mean? Like just like Johnny Laughter Seed. And that, all I'm doing is just encouraging people to have these exchanges. You know, they're hanging out. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I get jealous. I go, hey, man, what about me? <laughs> you know, I brought you all together. You know, they're, I see them at like hangouts, you know, even though it's 3,000 miles away. All these people on the East Coast, like three of them got together and went to this event together, this paint party. Well, wait a minute. What about me? You know, I was jealous. But I mean, if, if that's what can happen from this work, and I call them fun assignments, not assignments, that's another thing. I just step back and I realize when we're born, we're born in joy. We're born in light. We're born in love. That's who we are authentically. And then they tell you to do this and do that and comply. And it's all about compliance. And it's all about obedience. And that's what they do. They train you to believe. They, they give you a reward, a medal, a pat on the back. Way to go, kid. It's not good for us. It's, we're supposed to be our true self is to allow this happiness and allow this joy unencumbered by all that stuff. They're getting in line, get in line right away. You got a pledge of allegiance to this flag thing. But you don't step back and go, what's that mean? What does that mean? What if it, I've seen the flag used many times where it's not a good thing, okay? So I'm just supposed to pledge allegiance. So one of my books that's coming out, books that are coming out, is get out of line and into alignment. Get out of these lines, including watching programs that are gonna, just going to convince you otherwise, propaganda and so forth, and get in your own alignment. Tell, you, tell me what your own alignment tells you. And what it's telling you is always it wants your best, it's after your best interest, your alignment. It only wants you to be happy and free. Not free like the con artist that told my wife to leave for her sovereign freedom. <laughs> Not that kind of freedom. <laughs> it's a self-freedom, not being guided by the con artists of the world. Somebody stopped into my um, my course. They said, is this a cult? And, we, and now everyone who's taken the course started laughing at the guy. Yeah, sure, it's a cult. <laughs> you know who you're talking to? <laughs> that, that, that's what the yeah, I have a wife who left for a cult. My father was a cult leader. But I know about cults. And this isn't one because... It's only after our, our betterment. You're not being asked to put a, you know, a, a brand, you know, burn a brand of, of me on your belly or whatever it was they did with Nexium or whatever. It's not that kind of, it's yeah, not like. You gotta be easy with that hand motion. <laughs> Is that what I did? <laughs> yeah, well, wend on that call back. Yeah, for all you YouTube people, you can. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, you know, just, just stop, just take a pause. Just, you know, for, uh, take a pause for the cause of your own freedom to really challenge these beliefs that they put into you they're not real beliefs but believe in yourself enough that you can have happiness and joy and i think don't take it all too seriously sometimes. that's right take laughter seriously take i like that yeah don't take it all too seriously. it's one of my slogans take, which one take laughter seriously i like that it's good I, that, that, you just came up on the spot but either way it's beautiful no, sorry i wasn't spontaneous <laughs> no. I just, i've said it before <laughs> hey no it's all good we can play maybe maybe that'll be the name of the episode What's that? Maybe we can use your slogan. We can make that the name of the episode. Yes. Put what a good idea. There We're we collaborators. There we go, baby. I didn't even have to invite you to collaborate <laughs> on Instagram. It's just happening right here there naturally. Yes. No, for real. This, I'm, I'm, this is Mike on the mic. I'm, this has been, I had a lot of fun doing this. For real. Awesome. I wanna, Craig, I want to thank you for you're, being here. You were great. Um, thank you, man. And thank uh, you. guys, thank you for tuning in next time. And uh, check out the show description. Go follow Craig and uh, check out everything he's got on his books. Uh, I almost said programs. Craig Shoemaker, yeah, spell shoe, like shoes. Not Shoemaker. And a maker. We're not uh, talking about <laughs> Gillette. Um, but other than that, guys, another episode of Dead Talks. And uh, thanks for being here. Ciao. Thank you so much for tuning in to another episode of Dead Talks. Please do not forget to hit the subscribe button and also the notification bell. That'll give you updates as to when we post a new video, more episodes, and more content in general. We are streaming on all the major podcast platforms, including Apple, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Pandora, and all that. 
And also find us on Instagram at Dead Talks Podcast or www.deadtalks.net. Thank you so much.